Today we're going to be starting a new series entitled Quitting Time. Quitting Time. Now as soon as I say that, I know for some of you, going off in your mind is that Jimmy Buffett song, right? <laughs> or, or maybe it's the, uh, that song about take this job and give it to somebody else. <laughs> well, it's not quite the way it's worded. But we're going to be looking at some areas where Jesus taught his disciples and those who listened to his teaching to stop thinking a certain way. Stop acting a certain way because he had introduced a new life to them. Have you ever thought about what the disciples experienced in that three-year time span? Jesus arrives on the scene. He launches something brand new, a new kind of relationship, uh, one with the true and true God of the universe. He introduces a brand new covenant, a brand new movement. And get this. His followers are going to be called the church. The church. Life seemed to be going really good for this ragtag group. And then, like that, he's crucified. He's dead. Game over. End of the story. Their world was absolutely shattered. What do we do now? They hid in fear thinking the same thing was going to happen to them. And suddenly, Jesus appeared to them. He is risen from the dead, and it was at that moment the followers finally got it. All the Old Testament laws and the customs and the rituals are null and void. These followers were left with a new version of what they believed. It was a resurrection religion. Somebody wants to ask you, are you religious? You say, yeah, I've got a resurrection religion, right? You see, these people saw him die on the cross. And then get this, later they had lunch with him. Can you imagine what that must have been like? They were absolutely convinced that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God who came to save the world from all its sins. They were, were left with an odd assortment of teaching from Jesus over the last three years. Remember, there are the parables. We looked at one last week. Remember, the disciples are scratching their head thinking, what in the world does this mean? And he'd have to explain it to them. There was teaching about who he was, fully God and fully man. There was, there was teachings about what is most important in life. Remember, he said we're to love one another, the most important commandment of all. And then, oh man, there was that one teaching about if someone slaps you in the cheek, you're supposed to turn the other cheek? Wait a minute, that's not what my daddy taught me. He said if somebody slaps you in the cheek, you punch him in the nose, right? Oh, you let him slap the other cheek, and then you punch him in the nose. No, 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 no that's not what he... And then there's a whole issue about forgiveness. Jesus said I'm supposed to forgive him 70 times 7. Lord, how can I keep track of everybody that many times? Ah, that's the point. You see, they had witnessed many, many miracles and many healings. And, and, and these men could recall that Jesus did when, when he was among them. And what happened is people began to write things down. But their writings didn't begin immediately after Jesus ascended into heaven. We know the Apostle Paul didn't start writing for about 25 years. His writings weren't in circulation to somewhere between 30 and 35 years later. So for approximately the first 50 years after Jesus rose from the dead, all the church had was eyewitness accounts from those who had heard Jesus teach, wrote down notes, and began to circulate the stories. So what was it like to be a follower of Jesus if all you had was what Jesus taught, the basics about life? There there comes down to about five teachings, five different teachings that Jesus gave to his earthly followers on things they needed to quit doing or never even start. These five teachings didn't make much sense until he had risen from the dead and ascended back into heaven. And we're going to pull out the first stop, which is quitting fear, quitting fear. How do we stop fear? That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, let me rephrase it the way Jesus said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You see, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is about to send the disciples out two by two. 
They're, they're going to go out into a, a very difficult world. And he tells them here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, Jesus is going to some disciples out two by two, and he tells them, you're going to be like sheep among wolves. This is going to be a dangerous time for you. Some of you are going to be beaten. Some of you are going to have to give up everything to follow me. And Jesus ends his assignment telling them in verse 26, and do not fear. Do not fear. And then again, he states it in verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Let me ask your parents, why is it you repeat the same thing over and over and over again to your children? Why? You want them to get it, right? Why is it Jesus repeating the same thing to us here? He wants us to get it. Now, I imagine the disciples are staring at Jesus like deer in headlights. You know that look? Around here, it's pretty, pretty common to see deer caught in your headlights. I imagine that's what it was like for them. And so Jesus gives them this illustration. You know, there are two sparrows you could buy for a penny. They don't seem to be worth much, but you know what? Your heavenly Father knows about them, and he cares for them. And then he goes on to say, you know what? Your heavenly Father knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows all about you. And so the disciples are beginning to connect the dots. And so today, what I want to do is look at two boat trips that the disciples took. And, and I assure you, Gilligan was not on either one of these boat trips. They left him and the skipper off. In Matthew chapter 8, we see the first boat trip. In Matthew chapter 8, we see that Jesus is surrounded by a crowd of people. He needs to get away, so he's going to get him and the disciples on the boat. They get on the boat, and they row out to the Sea of Galilee. Now, Matthew was an eyewitness to this. He was in the boat. And suddenly, this ferocious storm comes up. Now, the Sea of Galilee, understand, is in a valley, and, and the winds would just funnel down and make the storm even more intense, even stronger. The water began to come into the boat. Can you imagine? You're in the boat, and you're rocking back and forth. You're being tossed around like a rag doll. Water's coming in. It's hitting you. You're drenched. You're, you're, you're scared. You're going to capsize. You're going to go down. Now, before we get too judgmental of them, have you ever been in an airplane when it goes into some turbulence? You're flying along, maybe dozing off, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. And then it has one of those big drops, and your heart comes up into your mouth. You hear people screaming and crying. That's kind of the situation it would have been for them. They were scared. They thought they were going to die. And where's Jesus in all this? Oh, yeah, he's up in the front of the boat sleeping. In Matthew chapter 8, starting verse 23, it says, Now when, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Folks, please understand, Jesus could have spoken the word and have the warm storm not even come up. Jesus knew the storm was coming. He could have said, hey guys, I want you to just set aside for a couple hours because a bad storm's coming and I don't want you to get caught in it. He could have done that, but he didn't do either one. It's important for us to realize this point. The disciples were in the storm because they obeyed Jesus. The disciples were in the storm because they obeyed Jesus. Now remember Jonah? God spoke to Jonah and said, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach repentance to those people. And Jonah says, mm, I don't think so. And he hops on a boat headed in the opposite direction. And God sent this terrible storm that hit this boat that Jonah was on. Remember, they threw everything overboard, the cargo, the tag, everything. And, and they're still afraid they're not going to make it. Finally, Jonah speaks up and said, yeah, God, throw me overboard. They throw him overboard. A giant fish comes and swallows him, vomits him up later, and he finally was obedient to God. But the storm came in Jonah's life because he was disobedient. But understand here, the storm came in the disciples' life because they obeyed him. They're being obedient to God. Now, as I read this through, I, I must confess, I often wonder, was Jesus truly asleep here? Or did he just have his eyes closed listening to all the hysteria that's going on, right? You know, that's what some people do. I, I don't know if he was asleep or not, but what I do know this is that some of you here today, whether you're watching online 
or whether you gather here with us, some of you are in the midst of a terrible, terrible storm. You're struggling. Your boat's rocking back and forth. And you feel like the disciples. We're going down. What am I going to do? We say things like, Lord, I thought I was obeying you. I thought I was doing your will. And you let this happen to me. It doesn't make sense. Life is crashing down around us. And it seems like Jesus is sleeping. And like Jonah, some, some have chosen to run from God. Obviously, you don't care about me. You don't love me. And and we're running away from God. Because of stormy events in our life, we just run the other way. You prayed and prayed and prayed, and what? You heard no answer. I don't know if he was sleeping. I don't even know if anybody's up there paying attention to me. But you chose, like Jonah, to run the opposite way. Because Jesus didn't respond the way you thought he should. And basically you said, well, either God, you don't exist or you just don't love me. It doesn't matter. And some have chosen to turn their back and walk away from God. And I want to tell you today, whether you're here or whether you're watching online, if that is a choice you made, I want you to consider coming back to faith. Coming back to being a follower of Jesus. And here's why. We are not the first people. We are not the first people that had this happen to. We're not the first and we're not going to be the last. See, the people who knew Jesus best, who loved him the most, had a moment where they felt like Jesus let them down. He didn't care. He just kept sleeping. Well, the story goes on in Matthew chapter 8. You see the disciples woke him up. You see it in verse 25 and 26. Then his disciples came to him and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're perishing. Now, I don't know, but you know what it's like when you're waking up and you've been sleeping hard and, and kind of a panic wakes you up? I wonder if that wasn't the way for Jesus. Oh, yeah, guys, what's going on? <laughs> Why are you fearful, oh, you little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. Oh, you of little faith. Folks, understand what that phrase means. It doesn't mean they didn't have any faith at all. It refers to the faith they had was a defective faith, a defective faith. It didn't work to full capacity meaning it's flawed. It wasn't working like it should. And then what's he do? He gets up and he rebukes the wind and the sea and it calmed right down. Folks, don't miss this. It shows that Jesus has authority over nature. It shows that Jesus had authority over nature. Think back to the Old Testament. Remember when God's people were in Egypt, they were in slavery and bondage and they cried out to God and God sent Moses down. Moses goes to Egypt. He confronts Pharaoh, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, I don't think so. It says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. God sent a plague. Moses goes back the second time to Pharaoh, let my people go. No. Scripture says Pharaoh hardened his heart. God sent another plague. A third time, Moses goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. No way. A third time, it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. God sent another plague. The fourth time, Moses goes, says, let my people go. It says, Pharaoh said no. But there's a change in wording. It says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the plague came, and another plague. And you know there's a total of ten plagues. The tenth plague being the death of the firstborn. And then Pharaoh and all of Egypt said, go on, get out of here. Take these people and go. It gave them their silver, their gold. Just get out of here. Moses leads the people out. They go into the wilderness, come up to the Red Sea. Pharaoh changed his mind and sent the, sent the army out after him. They, they loaded up their chariots and went after the people. And here they are, the Red Sea in front and Pharaoh's army behind them. And God put a cloud down to hold the army back. And then Moses lifted his, his staff And the Red Sea parted. It says that God's people went across on dry ground. They get to the other side, and God lifts the cloud. And what happens? The chariots and the army start coming across. They get in the middle of the Red Sea. God closes it up, and they all drown. You know, Moses and the people, they go and they wander in the wilderness, disobey God. That whole generation had to die off. Joshua steps up as the new leader. Joshua is to lead the people into the promised land. 
They go across the Jordan, and the first city they come against is Jericho. Huge, massive, high walls, thick, thick walls. At the very top of the walls, it was so thick you could have chariot races around them, three wide. And God gave Joshua a game plan, a battle plan. I just want you to march around that city for seven days. On the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times. You blow the ram's horn, and you shout to God. And what happened? The walls fell down. God's people went in straight up. We see over and over and over again in the Old Testament how God proved himself in many ways to his people. We skip forward to a prophet named Elijah. Elijah, a great man of God. Remember, Elijah challenged all the false prophets of Baal. 450 false prophets of Baal. Another 400 false prophets. Come on, guys, I challenge you. We'll, we'll both put together a sacrifice. You call upon your God. I'll call upon my God. We'll see which God answers prayer. The false prophets put their, their offering together, and they cried to their God, and they cut themselves, and they danced, and nothing happened. And I love Elijah. Hey, your God going to the bathroom or what? <laughs> hey, is your God taking a nap? And they, he let them have a sufficient amount of time. He said, that's enough of this nonsense. He stood up and they got their offering, the wood. They had a trench there. He said, hey, well, get some water, pour it on the offering, and do it again, and do it a third time. The wood, the offering, the trench was filled with water. It was saturated. And Elijah said a simple prayer. And God sent down fire. And it licked up the offering and all the water that was in the trench. Remember, our God, our God is a wet wood fire lighter. Amen? And see, these people, these disciples, they would have remembered these stories and many, many more. They would have remembered all those Old Testament stories they had learned. Can you imagine how they must have felt sitting in that boat? This furious storm is going on around them. The waves are blowing over. They're being tossed about like rag dolls. We're going to die. What's going to happen to us? And Jesus scolds them. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you fearful? Now, folks, let's be honest here. Doesn't that seem a little harsh? A little unloving, unkind? Jesus, can't you see we're scared, we're hurting, and you have that response? And then he stands up and he rebukes the wind. He rebukes the waves and it all became calm. In verse 27, it tells us, So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Okay, they would have remembered this experience. And then they go up in Matthew chapter 10, he's going to send them out. He's going to send them off to minister. And now they're beginning to connect the dots. It is a matter of what or whom to fear. And what he's telling you and me is, don't fear diseases. You don't have to be worried about diseases. Don't fear this storm you're in. Don't fear the person or the one that can kill the body. Don't fear these political leaders. All these things can only kill the body, but they can't touch your soul. Instead, he's saying what we need to fear or be in reverent awe of the one who controls the ultimate destiny of our souls. That's the one we need to be fearful of. That's the one we need reverent awe of the one who controls the ultimate destiny of our soul. This is the one that can speak a word and calm the storm. It's the one who is in control of everyone and everything. Now, now let's just be honest. The disciples weren't the sharpest knife in the drawer, right? I, I think I probably would have fit in well with this group. And so they'd witnessed Jesus doing this over this, and they, they witnessed many other things Jesus did. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? They had experienced Jesus commanding the winds to stop, and yet they allowed fear to grab hold of them again. And so Jesus is going to send them on a second boat trip. We see that in Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, Starting at verse 45, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when the evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, the, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch. Folks, understand the fourth watch would be between 3 and 6 a.m. Now about the fourth watch of the night, 
he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. That phrase, would have passed them by, literally reads, desires to come alongside of. It indicates his intention. Jesus wanted to see, would they invite him into boat? Would they recognize him, invite him into the boat? See, the crowds were, were descending on Jesus, pushing on him from every side. And so he tells the disciples, you, you go out away. I'm, I'm going to send them off. I want to spend some time in prayer. Now, think about the last time they were on a boat trip. We just looked at it in Matthew chapter 8. What would you have said if you'd have been there? Uh, Jesus, you know, last time we went, that didn't work out so well. You sure you want us to do this? And, and can't you just visualize Matthew saying something like this, uh, Jesus, I, I looked at the boat and I realized they're not U.S. official Coast Guard life jackets on board, so we better not go, <laughs> right? It doesn't seem very safe to me. I'm not sure we ought to take this trip. But Jesus wanted to send the crowds away. He wanted to go up and spend time in prayer. And he wanted, don't miss this, he wanted the disciples to be alone. You see, sometimes God wants his sons and daughters to go through things alone. Sometimes he puts us through those stormy events alone. There's a strong headwind that has them rowing for hours and hours and hours. You know what it's like when you're physically exhausted? Your, your thinking becomes really fuzzy. Remember, I used to have a job where I worked a lot of overtime and I had an hour's drive home and driving home I'd begin to see things that weren't there and I would chew Excedrin just to stay awake. Oh, it's nasty. And I imagine that's the situation they were in. They're exhausted. They're, they're, they're starting to see things. It's shortly before dawn, and Jesus walks out to meet them. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they became terrified. They thought it was a ghost. Look at verses 49 and 50. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Here we go again. Second boat ride. Second boat ride. And what's Jesus want? He wants to test their faith and see if they would invite him in. He wants to test their faith and see if, he would, if they would invite him in. Do you realize Jesus does the same thing with you and me? He wants to test our faith and see if we'll invite him in to the struggle we're going through. In fact, he allows these storms to come into our life to see if we will grow in our faith and invite him in to help us. Or are we just going to try and do it alone? You take a day off, God. I got this. Now, we don't say that, but isn't that what our actions show? You see, Jesus tells them, it's I, do not be afraid. They're still not learning that the storms of life are not to be feared. But let's be honest, are we any different today? Are we really any different today? Jesus was the one who was sent from God, who is to be feared, and yet they still don't get it. Jesus tries to explain once again, there will come a day when I'm not going to be with you. I'm not going to be here physically on earth. But yet I will be with you in a sense. Because God the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit. And John Chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, But the helper, known as the comforter, the paraclete, the comforter, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. You need not be afraid because even though physically I will not be here with you, because God the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit and I are one, you know, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all one. Because God the Holy Spirit is with you, I'll be with you. You need not be afraid. See, Jesus wants them and us to know he is always, always, always with us. He's always with us. You don't have to be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of. But unfortunately, this is a lesson that Jesus continually tries to teach to the disciples, even up to the point of crucifixion. Well, it goes on here in Mark chapter, in Mark chapter 6, verse 51 and 52. It says, Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvel. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Their heart was hardened. These men who sat under the ministry of Jesus for three years, for three years, 
And when he's crucified, what they do? They were terrified and ran. And, and what is happening here? It says their heart was hardened. Why? Because they didn't understand. Folks, please do not miss this. Miracles and healings do not necessarily soften a hardened heart. Miracles and healings do not necessarily soften a hardened heart. The disciples saw both, and yet their hearts were hardened. I remember as a new Christian, you know, I, I started praying for, for family members and people I cared about, co-workers, and, and I prayed, oh God, if they could just see a miracle. Oh God, if you would just touch her and heal her. Oh God, if you could touch him and heal him. They, they would see that your hand's on him, and they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. Uh-uh. Miracles and healings do not necessarily mean that someone's going to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It doesn't soften hardened hearts. That phrase, their heart was hardened, refers to the inability to understand because of a rebellious attitude. A rebellious attitude. Do you ever have one? Do you ever have a rebellious attitude? We need to be very, very careful when we start having this rebellious attitude. Because where can it lead? Just like the disciples, hearts that are hardened. We go on and we read through the Gospels and the Epistles and we see that later, these very same men became fearless and bold. What happened? How did they finally get it? Folks, understand, it wasn't another lesson on fear. It wasn't another boat ride. It wasn't another teaching from the Messiah. It wasn't another miracle of seeing him walking on water. It was that these people saw the resurrected Savior. And once Jesus rose from the dead, they became absolutely fearless. Why? Because the ultimate enemy, which is death, was defeated once and for all. Amen? That's why I want to encourage you. Mark your calendars, November 7th. Come and join us for BAC 90, Pastor Ryan's teaching on apologetics. I am convinced that is the linchpin for our, our strong faith. Because if the resurrection is true, our preaching is foolish. You see, when they lost their fear of death, they lost all fear. Nothing they witnessed during their time with Jesus got rid of the times of fear. But it was seeing the resurrected Savior and the filling of the Holy Spirit that changed everything. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it tells us, Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Folks, this is what we need to realize. When we finally stake our, our eternity on the fact that Jesus Christ really died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead, and when he ascended into heaven, he sent God the Holy Spirit to live in us. When we understand those facts, we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear. When we are, give, when we are given the same resurrection life that the, the apostles did, the disciples did, the fear of death, the fear of harm, it begins to evaporate in our life when we finally understand it. Once we are no longer afraid that we recognize that people or situations can only harm the body, but we have someone greater inside of us who controls and protects our souls. And we need to get a handle on that. Something happens inside of us, and fear not becomes a way of life. Fear not is becomes what we are, who we are. Late in the second century, Marcus was the emperor who ruled Rome about 180 A.D., he oversaw what is considered to be the fourth major persecution of Christians. It was during this time there, there was a, became known as a Roman uh, med uh, medical writer, a famous Roman doctor named Claudius Gallinus. And his writings have been preserved. And in these writings, he actually mentions Christians. Back in those days, it was illegal to examine a dead body. And once the person died, they immediately either buried him or burned him. They didn't have autopsies back then. And so what the doctors would do, the doctors would hang around places like the arena where obviously there's going to be a lot of people dying, and they would examine the dying bodies before they actually passed away. Now this famous writer, you've got to understand, he would not be in favor of Christianity. So this is what you call a writer from a hostile source. This famous writer had examined lots of dying bodies, even the bodies of dying Christians during the time of persecution. 
Again, now, this is about 150 years after Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And in his writings, he wrote the following about Christians. This is a quote. For fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something we witness in them every day. No matter what we put them through, no matter how much we want them to recant, no matter what we are trying to extinguish, there is a fearlessness of death and the hereafter. That is a non-Christian testimony. For fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something we witness in them every day. No matter what we put them through, no matter how much we want them to recant, no matter what we are trying to extinguish, there is a fearlessness and a death and the hereafter. It was the fearlessness of the early Christians that captured the attention of the Roman Empire. And this is why Jesus can say without batting an eye that you may not understand now, but you will. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Have such great reverence and fear of God Almighty who raises us from the dead that everything else just pales in significance. Do you know why Jesus can say to you and me, stop being afraid, quit fearing? If you're a Christian, you know why he can say that? Because he has been on the very boat that you're in. He's been in the very same circumstances you're in. He's saying, you don't have to be afraid, even though there's something to be afraid of, because I am with you. I am with you, and you need not fear, because I will be with you forever. Because you have been invited to submit yourself and surrender yourself, your fears to God who loves you, who is with you, who is not surprised by anything that's happening to you, and will walk with you, with you right through it, through, through the adversity, through the storm. Jesus punctuated his command to fear not, not just with another miracle, but with his own resurrection. He came back to prove, to prove he had authority over death. And if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and claimed to be one of his followers, he says to you and me today, fear not. Fear not. Even when there's something that looks like you ought to be afraid, fear not. I'm with you. Well, you know, there's one simple question I ask with every single sermon. Simply so what? So what, what does this mean for us today? So what? Well, what we need to understand is that with each new experience of testing demands more faith and courage. With each new experience of testing demands more faith and courage. Remember in the first storm, Jesus was right there physically with them. But the second storm, he sent them out on their own. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what your storm is. But there's a good chance that Jesus has you out there on your own and really wants to know is, will you invite him in to control your life? Will you trust him through the difficult storms you're in? You know, you and I have a great promise that the disciples didn't have. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, For he himself has said, this is Jesus, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the original language, that word never is never, 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 on to infinity. I will never, 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 never leave you, never, never, never forsake you. You see, believers, we can be content in every situation because we have this promise. And in Hebrews 6, 18, it says it is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So we can claim this promise because he can't lie to us. Each new experience of testing demands more faith and courage. And secondly, like the disciples, we, we can develop a hardened heart if we fail, if we fail to respond to the lesson we must learn. Like the disciples, we can develop a hardened heart if we fail to respond to the lesson we must learn. Folks, that's why it's so important we guard our hearts. We guard against a rebellious attitude. You see, we are in the midst of a stormy, stormy world. And most of us, what are we doing? We're working hard. We're rowing harder and harder and harder, trying to keep our boat afloat, trying not to sink. For some, it's losing a loved one. And that pain and that hurt never goes away. For others, your your family is falling apart. For some, your marriage is falling apart. For some, you're struggling with real severe health issues. What is it that you fear most? What is it that your boat is in the middle of the storm and the waves are coming on and they're rocking you and you feel like a rag doll, you're going to be tossed out, you're going to die? What is it? And you may be asking these questions, is Jesus asleep? God, is anybody up there paying attention to me at all? 
God, do you even care about me? You may be wondering, God, where are you? But you know the real question we need to ask? What is it you fear most right now? We each need to ask ourselves this question. What is it, what is it that you fear most right now? Because Jesus wants us to invite him in, come alongside of us, and he's saying to us, quit fearing. I got gotcha. you. Quit fearing. I will never, never leave you. I will never, never forsake you. Let the Holy Spirit take control and lead you to walk through these stormy waters. If you're able, would you stand with me for prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for preserving these examples for us to hang on to when the disciples went through the storms. Thank you for preserving the eyewitnesses who saw the resurrection of Jesus because that is what our faith is based on, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have the same resurrection with him if we have confessed him as our Savior and Lord, and we want to thank you. Help us. Help us to be men and women that are fearless, fearless in the face of adversity. We want to be like Jesus told us we should be, men and women without fear. We don't need to fear man. We don't need to fear disease. We don't need to fear, fear our circumstances. God, we're asking that you give us an overwhelming reference and fear of the God who controls our eternity and who sent his son into the world because he loves us more than he loves the sparrows. He knows the number of hairs on our head. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear from him. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said...